Top Bed Talk. Nick Majerison here from October the 19th to the 23rd. It's Anesthesiology 2019. The annual gathering of the American Society of Anesthesiologists in Orlando, Florida this year. Top Med Talk will be covering the conference from day one with live streaming of our conversations from the booth and unique content. Check out our website for more details www.topmedtalk.com Hello, this is Vicki Morton in Dingle, Ireland with the 21st Dingle Conference with EPBOM Evidence-Based Perioperative Medicine sitting here with Desiree Chapel today. Hello Desiree. Hi Vicki. You are always interviewing other people. I thought that somebody needed to interview you. You know, you have a you have quite a good story to tell with your background and everything you've done, everything you're doing. And um, I think it's important, you know, for your listeners to kind of know where you started <laughs> and, and what your background is. And what I wanted to know first is um, what what was your journey to becoming a CRNA? How did you decide to do that? To what, what's the background getting you there? Oh. Tell me about that. I actually graduated uh, from a small little liberal arts college in Indiana um, with a biology degree. And I was going to go to med school and that's all I wanted to do. And I kind of got into or got into you know college and of course I was like, eh, probably not going to be a good time for me to do that. And so I graduated with a biology degree. I was thinking I was probably going to head to med school or to um, law school. I was interested in environmental law. And... I uh, started putting applications in and kind of, I moved to Louisville, Kentucky and started just working uh, and I thought maybe that's probably not what I want to do. And uh, my mom's a nurse. Um, my new husband at the time, his mother was a nurse. Uh, and so I talked to them a lot about, you know, the profession and what you can do in the profession. And I started kind of diving into it a little bit more to figure out, you know, there's a lot of flexibility with it. You can do anything in the hospital. You can do a ton of stuff outside the hospital. So I thought there was a lot to be explored in nursing. And I didn't really know what kind of nursing that I wanted to do. But I thought I'd just start into school, get a degree. And then I really wanted to travel at that time um, and just see the world and see the U.S. for sure. And so I got into a, like a second degree nursing program at the University of Louisville. And within, I think it was, I don't know, a month of starting the program, uh, my husband, we were both bartending. He was bartending at the time. And um, he met a locum CRNA at the bar who came in every single night, who was from, I don't know, somewhere around the country. And um, he'd have dinner and he started talking to him about, you know, well, what do you do? And what is this about anesthesia? And he's like, you know, I think my wife might be, you know, find that really interesting. And so he invited me up the next night and I had dinner with a guy and he was like, why don't you come into the OR with me tomorrow and just check it out? He's like, I think you would really like it. So he took me into the OR and um, I watched some of the cases that we did were just kind of minor um, kind of things. But I mean, it's like the minute I set foot into the OR, I'm like, this is it. I love this. This is totally my jive. Like I met all the other, you know, docs and, and nurse anesthetists. And I just kind of felt like it was my people. And yeah. I mean, literally that, that meeting. It's your comfort zone. Yeah. And um, so pretty much from that moment on, I'm like, okay, this is, this is what I want to do. I want to get into anesthesia school. So I learned everything about it. And, um, you know, just worked my butt off. So what year was that, it. that you went into the OR for the first time? 2003. So it's interesting how you said, oh, the next day we went into the OR <laughs> and, and now you can't just, no, you can't, you can't no. just bring somebody into the OR and all the hoops you have to, you know, go through to, to get somebody yeah. into the OR. So I know I was super lucky. And I've thought about that several times. I'm like, you could never do that now, no. you know, and, and especially a locum taking some random person right. into the <laughs> OR would never happen. Would never fly. No. So yeah, I was, it was very uh, good timing. And, and, um, and so I just kind of said, you know, this is what I want to do. And every, you know, and back then, especially nursing programs never talked about anesthesia, nurse anesthesia, yeah. or it really that much. I mean, we were really starting to focus on advanced practice nursing, but that's where the program was going. I mean, they were starting right. their program. So they wanted everybody to go into that. And as a second degree person, they would, it was definitely appealing to, you know, a sure. lot of our group. So I did everything on my own trying to find out about the profession. Got into um, 
every, again, like every opportunity with externships and all that stuff, getting into critical care and getting that kind of background, but also getting in the OR as much as I can. And um, there was a particular CRNA that uh, when I was had an, uh, an, a, a day free to be able to do something, his name was Ian Farah, and he still works at UofL. And I went in with him and I just, it's like my whole world changed. I'm like, this, you know, he explained the whole system, you know, just everything about it was such an advocate. And the thing that I loved most about him and all the CRNAs that I met was how much they love their profession. You know, you can go anywhere in any any profession and talk to them and people are like, eh, it's okay. Or, right. you know, a lawyer or a doctor or something like that, you know, would you recommend this to your kids? And most people are going to say no. Right. And every single nurse anesthetist that I talked to you had said they absolutely 100% love their profession. Does everybody love their particular situation? No, of course not. But um, as a career and something that people really internalize as who they are and really as like, that's their being, it, it was, you know, a hundred percent, everybody thought that. And so I'm like, this is something that I think would be, you know, I, I, I feel very passionate about it. Like I'm a very passionate person. I'm like, I can see this, like I feel it. And so, um, I just, I worked my butt off, got into, um, you know, went into that straight into the ICU on days, which was insane. Um, but I had worked there all through school in, in the ICU where I was. And I had the most amazing experience because unlike today, the, I think it was 50% of those nurses had been in the unit for over 20 years. Wow. Yeah, you don't see that much today. Not at all. And and um, they became my friends and, my, and most importantly, my mentors. Yeah. And so they took me under their wing. So even before I was out of nursing school, I, they still would come in and look at this case. This is what we're doing, you know, and, and um, they did that. And then I went into straight into the ICU and, um, how long did you work in the ICU? I actually only worked a year. Okay. Um, it was really in unusual circumstances. So I was planning to work two to three years, get some experience, but I really wanted to start interviewing, um, and getting into the process for right. anesthesia school. Cause I was, I'm, I'm going to be prepared. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like that's just me. That's, that's your and, typical <laughs> approach to everything. So I can like, I believe that I, you know, so I'm like, well, I'm just going to like, I'm just going to put my application in and hope to get interviews and just interview as much as I can over the next couple of years while I was getting my CCRN and, you know, some of these sure. other certifications, because I was working really hard to get every certification that I could. So um, at the time, Texas Wesleyan started a program in uh, Louisville, which they're a large, you know, large, very old anesthesia program, um, but they, they have satellite sites. And so they had just started a satellite site in Louisville. And one of my friends is like, you know, you should really interview for that. I was like, yeah, why? Of course, you know, I will. I mean, there's no chance I'm going to get in because I've only been out a year. And it was a pretty tough competition with a lot of the nurses that were applying. And so I interviewed and, um, I got in. Wow. And so I was like, well, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. Why would so, you? So, I mean, you know, if they felt strong and, strongly enough that I was prepared to go into anesthesia school, then I was like, okay. And how many were in your class? Um, we had, so in the Texas Wesleyan program, there are 140 or 120. Okay. It's the largest program in the U.S. And our satellite, I think we started out with 12, 10 or 12. I think we ended up, I think we graduated six. Okay. It's a high attrition rate. Right. Yeah. In definitely. anesthesia school. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, got through anesthesia school and had planned to leave Louisville. And that's what I really wanted to do. I want to get out of Louisville. I want to go to school outside of Louisville. I wanted to, you know, as soon as I finished working, I wanted to get out and go, you know, I just wanted to move out of Louisville. But um, I enjoyed my experience at Audubon Hospital with the um, ACE group there, the Anesthesiology Consultant Enterprises. The medical directors there were phenomenal. Yeah. And, you know, it was cardiac. It was big, nasty cases. I mean, like and when I love. went there, it was like the superstars of anesthesia from all the places I had been. And so I was like, well, you know, this is, I want to get this background too. So I started there and I'm thinking that I would only be there for a couple of years and was there for well, 10 years, 11 years. I didn't so leave. You, you I never left. It. No. Yeah. When I you find your, your spot. Well, your groove. I mean, anytime I talk to you about um, CRNAs, your profession, you still have that same passion in your voice. I love that about you, Desiree. <laughs> so, so then most recently, you kind of stepped away from full time um, yeah. anesthesia and joined Top Med Talk. Yeah. And, um, but you still go back in on days. And, and when you do that, 
are you super excited about it? Do you, do you think, oh, you know, I want to <laughs> keep doing this full time or is it a good split for you? Yeah. How, how do you feel about it? Well, so it, it's been it, like, Transitioning into top my talk wasn't difficult. Like I was, you know, really gung ho about, or in, and I still am, but passionate about it. Um, what was hard was that I, the last three to four years of practicing um, at the community facility where I was, I was um, working with the enhanced recovery program, and you know, got that up and going. It was a really fantastic program, and. Over time, all of us kind of got strapped for um, for our time, sure. and couldn't be you know couldn't be as involved when we wanted to, as we wanted to be. Couldn't keep up with the education, and we were having a, a difficult time with getting buy in from administration to kind of put more resources into it. It's the typical story of like, well, you guys got it up and going, and it's going great. Right. We don't need leadership anymore. And I think Monty always talks about that happening in the UK with their program. Like, I mean, for me, I mean. I was convinced of enhanced recovery literally the first day that we changed practice and did it. I mean, I did all the research and we looked at all the stuff and got all the protocols and got ready. But it wasn't until I saw like those first patients come through and I'm like, oh my God, this makes an immediate difference. Yeah, a lot you know? of people have to see it. So <clears throat> your colleagues, did you have to convince them? Even after those first couple patients, were there still those CRNAs that were yeah. having difficulty kind of getting on board with it? Of course. I mean, you're always going to have that. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like the, you know, we were sort of the Rogers adoption curve, you know, it's like yep. the, the bell shaped curve of those that are early adopters and really gung ho and, and into it. And those that are kind of the laggers. I mean, to be completely honest, um, we had great buy-in though from our group. I mean, as a whole, I mean, there's always those couple people that are like, eh. And then there are the ones that did it and just kind of grumbled about it. And right. I was like, that's fine. Keep on grumbling, <laughs> but do your keep job. Doing it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't care what you say, yeah. um, how much you don't think that it works. But, you know, I, I, what really convinced our, our, our docs and our CRNAs is that, um, we, would always see our patients postoperatively the oh, next okay. day at 24 hours, you know, this, you know, the, the next morning, the CRNAs would always oh, do it. Sometimes great. the docs would even do it, mm-hmm. but most of the time the CRNAs. And so we were, everybody saw the difference for themselves right. and for the ones that weren't typically doing it. So some of the docs um, and how I got administrative buy-in was that we showed them the patients sure. and we did that. We took them on rounds with us to say, look, you know, this patient didn't have ERAS and this patient did and look at the difference. And so believing. So, um, that's kind of how we, we did it. And, but through time, you know, things were not going as I hoped that they would. We want to, you know, everybody wants to expand, but there's no one to do it. Right. And everybody's, you know, our enhanced recovery coordinator that we had as a part time, you know, she kept getting jobs piled on her and it just becomes very difficult. And, you know, as a coordinator, I mean, there's still a lot to be done. You're so adding much in, to be done. you know, we just started with a very generic enhanced recovery program. We wanted to start adding in immunonutrition, you know, all the prehabilitation stuff. And so I, I, there was just a level of frustration for me within the facility, within the organization. I'm like, oh, you know, like I just see we can do so much more. And especially being involved with everything that I was doing with Top Med Talk before I left and and, and EPOM and ACER. And so I was at these meetings every, you know, couple months hearing about all these things like, this is what we need to do. And I had a, a very good friend of mine, Rob Schwierz, who's the chief CRNA at um, Suburban, where I am now. And he came to the Ed Palm meeting. He's like, oh, my God, I totally get what you're going through now. He said, because you kind of drink the Kool-Aid. You do. And then you come back and you get really frustrated with people yeah. because they don't see, you know, they don't see what we see. So anyway, long story short, I um, I got very kind of frustrated in that role. Um, and so when I started Top Med Talk, I went part-time, just PRN um, with Rob at uh, Norton Women and Children's. And it's a very, it's just very different practice yeah. than what I'm used to. Um, a bit I'm more like refreshing, um, would you say? Or, you know, for somebody who's like kind of an adrenaline junkie, mm-hmm. you know, adrenaline junkie and like, you know, I love doing hearts. Like I love doing the big, like really, really sick cases. And so going to do, you know, a lot of just like easy GYN and a lot of easy ortho and things like that. It was, I kind of had to take a step back and kind of say, all right, you know, like you need to be doing something easier because I was really wanting to focus so much on top of talk. So I I appreciated it. Yeah. Um, and, and learn to love the breath, breath of fresh air yes. <laughs> that it yeah. was for that's, me. That's good. And embrace it. But, and I, there are a lot of people that leave, you know, pretty high intense practices and it takes a while to kind of yeah. say like, okay, I know I could still go do this, but it's not the best thing for me right sure. now or my family or whatever. And so 
Um, it's a fantastic practice. I love all the people there. They get along so well. They're yeah. so wonderful to each other. I appreciate it that I've been able to do that and then be able to focus, still have my clinical practice and my hand in it. Uh, but be able to focus on top med talk. Yeah, so. it's, I mean, it, from the outsider looking in, it's a great balance. It's a great mm-hmm. um, position you're in right now to be able to do yeah. that and, and just have that clinical time. But then you have the privilege of going to all of these yeah. meetings around the world and talking to these, you know, thought leaders around the world and, and getting some really great information. Yeah. And Well, you know what feels really good, too, is that... <clears throat> You know, we hear all these people talking about like all these amazing, you know, these studies and, you know, changing practice and what they're doing in their own practice to change. And, and so now it feels good to be able to go back and say, you know, I ha- I've changed a ton of my practice. I'm now, sure you even have. At, since, I mean, just since I've left, you know, full time practice, even in my PRM practice, like I've totally yeah. changed as I hear new things. And I'm kind of like, that feels kind of good. And now it's easier for me in my role. I mean, I don't have a role as a, a leadership role necessarily right. where I am, which is a bit of a challenge for me because <laughs> I'm a control freak. But uh, <laughs> it is, it's nice that I can go back and, and say, hey, have you all thought about this? Or, you know, I'll, I'll go to Rob, who is, you know, he's just putting out fires every day. But I'm like, Rob, look, I just heard this. Like, what is it? What are, what's our, you know, vent setting? What is our um, default vent setting? Like, do you think maybe we should change that? Or, you know, like little things. So like, I'm kind of working in the back door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To make change. Well, that leads me to a question then. So how many of your, your current colleagues then in the OR listen to you? Um, Have they downloaded? That's a, that's a good question. So I should say yes. <laughs> but I want people to listen to Top Med Talk because they want to listen to it, not sure. because I've told them to do it and that I think that it's a great thing. But are they thing. aware of it? Yeah, you know, I think that more more and more people, you know, as people ask, like, where are you, you know, where are you going? Like, you're gone all the time. Um, and so that just opens the conversation. So I'm, I'm getting there to get, yeah. so thank you everyone that is listening to this, that listen, that are friends of mine and, and colleagues. But um, what I have found just absolutely amazing, and I I just, I hadn't even thought about it, but then now that it's happening, I'm like, it's really, really cool is we have everywhere we go, like every meeting we go to, we have people come up and like, oh my God, we love Top Med Talk. Yeah. You know, I listen to it on the way to work. It's such a great, you know, really valuable and it's, um, it's, you know, fun to listen to and it's something totally different. And so to me, that validates everything that yes. we do. And it, I mean, and, and for the longest time, like, you know, you and I both and Monty, we've all, uh, you know, we're speakers on, yes. on, on speakers bureaus and we'll go out and we'll talk to a group of, I don't know, five people all the way up to, you know, a thousand people or 500 people. And I always would say before I came on to talk my talk, it's like, I just, I just want to change one person's mind because it, when you change one person's mind, usually, you know, that you, it can start something. Domino effect of that. Um, huge. but I mean, I was always like, I just want to change one person's mm-hmm. mind. And then I You're started changing thousands yeah. of yeah. people's minds. And, and I think that whenever I, Monty asked me to, to come on board. With Top Med Talk, you're going to lots of conferences around the world. Mm-hmm. What has been your favorite? Oh, that's a good question. If you, if you had to choose one. When we went to ASA, we got to interview Henrik yep, Kellett. Yep. It was, what was yeah. really cool about that um, was that, first of all, for just me being... I was at the top of the Hilton in San Francisco and it was like this amazing, gorgeous yeah. view. It's an amazing morning. You know, we're pumped about getting ready to interview him and, you know, Monty's Monty. So, you know, he's right. like cool about everything. Yeah. <laughs> and, I'm, and I was like trying to hold my cold. I'm like, oh my God, like Desiree Chapel from Louisville, Kentucky, nowhere, a community hospital. You know, when's the last time I had read an article before I started getting involved on <laughs> in this? You know I mean? I had, but not... You know, and here I am at the top, uh, you know, of the world. Yes. With, you know, Monty Mylan and Henrik Collette. I, like, you're a lucky, what the lucky woman. <laughs> Very lucky. Um, and it's kind of, you know, like some people are like, oh my God, you're such a geek. But I'm, when you get into this and you see like their names are on everything. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's so, that well, was, it was like a moment. It was like a star studded yeah. kind of like, oh my God. Like, I don't really care about like Hollywood people. Like, <laughs> these are the people I care about. Totally. And, I understand uh, that. And so that was that was super cool. Um, I love that. Uh, what about the um, the conference you had told me? Um, literature that was that had just come out or going to be coming out? New oh, trials. The Prado, that, the Prado meaning. Yes. Oh my God! I would say I that. Are you telling me about I that would, with just so much passion in your voice? And yeah, you were so excited. 
I'm telling you, I had never been anything like that before. Again, old hat for you know Monty and the crew, but um, and it was it was interesting because we kind of you know we're so used to like sitting down and talking to people just like free will and like you know uh, and planning so much. But that particular meeting was kind of awkward. You know, it felt like, well, are we going to be able to get some good recordings? What are we going to be able to do? And you did. You um, we did. Great we got some amazing you and um, some of my faves. I mean, you know, but. Um, that particular meeting was for me, especially again, as a complete non-academic, like sitting in the room with those people and listening to what they're working on and what's coming out. And, um, I mean, let alone just the fact that someone was embargoed. So you had some really cool information <laughs> for anybody else did, but, um, it, it was, it was like, I was getting, I was a fly on the wall and this amazing, like think tank. Yeah. Um, because you know, this, some of the stuff, like I could follow it all, but I'm like, oh my God, you know, the brain power in this room is unbelievable. And if you could do more of those, I think we could change the world, but yeah, I wish there were more of those. And why do they have to be so far away? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, I had to tell you Prado wasn't so damn bad, but <laughs> uh, well, really I mean, nice. I'd go there for that, but, <laughs> but yeah, to, to make it more accessible, but you know, hopefully we'll be able to do yeah. things more like that, more like that. I mean, I think the pokey thing. You know, whenever yes. they get together in a room and it's like, again, that was another one of those moments of like, oh my God, I'm a fly in the wall on this. You know, you have the biggest people in fluids, you know, sitting yes. all in the room, having these amazing discussions and this back and forth. Like, See, now I would like to hear that. Absolutely. Everybody would. Yes. I mean, everybody would get, gather something and from that. And hear everybody's perspective and really yeah. get you thinking about some things. Yeah. So I can only imagine how cool that is. So this is your first time in Dingle. It is. <laughs> and at the, the Dingle Conference. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's not my first time in Dingle. But, but no, was, first time at the conference. The conference, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Because you were in Dingle. The summer. The summer, right. Mm-hmm. You know, I had always heard from everybody that had been here before, like, what an amazing, ex- you know, it's just, the, it's so special. It just is a, like, such a special moment in people's lives. And I mean, the people would just keep coming back every year. And I'm like, well, you know, how special can it really be? <laughs> I mean, I know it's cool, but how cool can it really be? And um, when I came here this summer, I'm like, oh, my God, this is such a unique place on earth. You know, I mean, I, whatever you believe in, like, it doesn't matter. Like, it just, you can tell there's something here that's really um, amazing. And so... Um, and and how gracious everybody yes. is to the attendees. Yeah. Um, you know, they appreciate us being mm-hmm. here. And um, and I, I love that. Um it has been a great conference. It always is. I love the size of this conference yeah, and the dialogue size. that happens. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm glad to see that people weren't a, weren't afraid to stand up and ask questions. Or yeah. ask, instead of, you know, like I love just that back and forth um, with this conference. Um, and Dwight said to me last night, you realize we're going to have to come back every I know. year. <laughs> I said, I know. yes, darling, I realized that last year. But <laughs> Well, yeah. I, you know, I mean, it, it is, it's like this enchanted, like enchanted place. And, it is. and I love, I love it. And I, I think that everybody that comes here loves it. And um, I, I mean, I, it's, it's really easy for all of us to go back now yes. and be like, oh my God, you've got to go to Dingle. Like, yes. this is like the coolest, you know, if yes. you're going to spend money on a meeting, like, yep. this is the meeting to come to. Absolutely. And I mean, it just, it just is. Well, so. and, That's well, point. I know, Des, um, you know, we met a few years ago and you've taught me so much <laughs> and, um, I'm honored and <laughs> to go crazy <laughs> to, to call you my friend and Thank to be you. your friend. And, Thank you. um, I appreciate you letting me sit down and have people hear the, Desiree Chapel side <laughs> of Top Mental. Well, for whatever it is. I mean, you know, it's, uh, we all have our journey. And we I do. think that we should, everybody needs to be proud of what, what they do. Absolutely. And, um, You've done a lot. And you're so. doing so much still. I mean, that's another interview. Um, <laughs> but we need to, at some point, talk about everything that you have done, you're working on, what's to come, what you're accomplishing. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, some great things. Stay tuned because it'll be part two at some <laughs> oh, point. God. And uh, it might it's be time okay. for a Guinness. I think it is. I'm, I'm, I'm a little low. I'm starting, I'm starting to I'm shake. shaking too. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Vic. Thank you, Desiree. Top Med Talk. It's Desiree Chapel here. Just a quick reminder, subscribe to Top Med Talk. We're a daily source of news and conversation focused on perioperative care. We bring you all the latest talk from all the major conferences in the perioperative space. 
We can also be found on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and we now have a free mailing list with special offers and additional goodies for subscribers. Go check us out at topmedtalk.com. That's www.topmedtalk.com.